Jesus speaking, and he says, I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not only speak on his own, he will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me, because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. Jesus went on to say, In a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me. At this, some of his disciples said to one another, What does he mean by saying, In a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me. And because I am going to the Father, they kept asking, what does he mean by a little while? We don't understand what he is saying. Jesus saw that they wanted to ask him about this, so he said to them, Are you asking one another what I meant when I said, In a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me? Very truly I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. So with you. Now is your time of grief, but I will see you again, and you will rejoice, and no one will take away your joy. This is the gospel of our Lord. I wonder how you would feel if I started my message with these words. I have a lot to tell you, but frankly, you can't handle it. <laughs> That's basically what Jesus said to his disciples in John chapter 16, verse 1. He said to them, I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. To understand the context for this statement, we have to go back a little bit. Let's take a look at uh, John chapter 16 and verse 7. Jesus speaking. But very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Jesus has been telling his disciples that he is about to leave them. Their leader, their Lord, is about to go away. The one for whom they have left everything. The one who has taught them and shown them the truth about God. The one that they love above all. Now, he is going away. And to them, it seems like a catastrophe. Earlier, when Jesus raised the possibility of his disciples leaving him, Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. John 6 and 68. Following his resurrection, Jesus will ascend to his Father, leaving them without the words of eternal life, or so it seems to them. So Jesus reassures them that he will make sure that they are taken care of. In fact, it is to their advantage that Jesus will go away. They will not be left alone. They will actually be better off. Now when the eternal Son of God was born as a human, we call that the incarnation, God in the flesh, when he was born as a human, he accepted some self-imposed limitations. For example, when Jesus was here on earth, he could only be in one place at one time. If he was in Jerusalem, he couldn't be in Galilee. And when he was here as a human among us, he could only speak to those who were within the sound of his voice. But the Holy Spirit, Jesus calls him the Spirit of Truth, 
The Holy Spirit will not be limited in any way. He will be present everywhere, in all the world, and throughout all history. Now with this thought as background, let's look again at verse 12, where Jesus says, I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. <coughs> Jesus had been telling his followers about his impending death on the cross, and they couldn't understand. They expected a Messiah who would be a victorious warrior king, not a suffering servant. They are not ready to see their Lord be executed on a cross, hung between two criminals. And for sure, they are not yet ready to face the persecution that will come their way in the future, when they themselves will be jailed and beaten and even killed as they spread the joyful faith of Jesus throughout the world. Jesus goes on to say, in the first part of John chapter 16, verse 13, But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. On another occasion, Jesus said, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Jesus promises that the Spirit will take on His role in guiding people to the truth. In Bible college, students who are learning how to preach practice on one another. And one Bible college student had a great idea for a, well, he wanted to make a point about truth. And so he prepared two pieces of uh, that thin cardboard type stuff, and on one he wrote the word truth in capital letters, but he left spaces between each of the letters, between the T, the R, the U, the T, and the H. And that was on one piece of paper, and in between the letters for truth, he wrote in the words L-I-E. Then he took a second piece of paper and he cut five holes in the paper so that when he placed it over the front first piece of paper, the first piece of cardboard, through the holes you could read the words, the word truth, T-R-U-T-H. And to make his point, he got up in front of the class and he says, now what happens when you stretch the truth. And he pulled it out, and when he pulled it out, the other letters appeared in the central holes. L-I-E. When you stretch the truth, it becomes a lie. Right? So everything was going famously, and then one of the other students said, and what happens when you stretch a lie? So he pulled it out a little further, and it said, roof. <laughs> I want to be clear that that is no reflection on anyone present here this morning. <laughs> to God, truth is an absolute value, and it is not to be compromised. Okay? Truth, what is truth? Truth is that which agrees with reality. Anything that does not agree with reality is false. Now, contrary to popular opinion, there are not many truths. There is not my truth and your truth. We don't all have a different truth. There is one truth. And there is only one who could say with integrity, I am the truth. Now that one promises his friends, his followers, that he will send the spirit of truth who will guide us into all the truth. As the 23rd Psalm says, he leads me in the paths of righteousness. That is, mm -hmm. he guides me along the right paths, mm -hmm. as another translation puts it. You can be confident that the spirit of truth will not mislead you. He will never leave you, lead you wrong. Now you may get bad advice from your financial counselor. 
It happens. But you will never get bad advice from the capital C counselor, who is the spirit <coughs> of truth. The spirit will always lead you to Jesus. And the Spirit will be with you in every situation of life. Even the most horrible, hellish place that you may ever have to experience. Even in the valley of the shadow of death, you need fear no evil. <coughs> now, Jesus said, everything that I learned from my Father, I made known to you. That's John chapter 15, verse 15. In the same way, Jesus says of the Spirit, He will not speak of His own. He will only speak what He hears. It is from Me that He will receive what He will make known to you. So, in the same way that the Father sent the Son, the Son now sends the Spirit. There is a direct line from Father to Son to Spirit. There is perfect unity between them. Every word that the Spirit speaks to us comes from the Father and from the Son. Every prompting of the Spirit in your life comes from the one, the true and living God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus said, He, the Spirit, will tell you what is yet to come. That's in verse 13 of our study passage. This includes, of course, prophecy. We heard this morning the scripture from Revelation about the new Jerusalem, the new heaven, and the new earth. But it includes more than that. It really includes all truth. When we are born again, we start out as spiritual babies. Then, as we grow and mature in our faith, the Spirit reveals more and more of His truth to us. The Spirit continues to guide each believer and each local church. He helps us to apply God's eternal truth to changing situations in a changing world. We're all aware of the fact that technology changes, right? Until not so long ago, a telephone was something that hung on a wall with a cord attached to a box, right? And now practically every one of us carries a cell phone in our pocket that connects us to the whole world and all kinds of information. Technology changes and is changing more and more rapidly. The political situation changes as well. What's in one year is out the next. And public opinion, wow, does that ever change in a hurry? Right? But the same faithful spirit of truth guides us as we apply eternal truth in new and faithful ways. I think of uh, Peter. He was of the mind that Jesus had come only for the Jewish people. But then he received a vision from the Spirit of God, teaching him a lesson that Jesus was for everybody. So he went to the house of Cornelius and spoke to the family that was gathered there. And those people who had no connection <laughs> to the Jewish people received the same Holy Spirit from God. And Peter said, I now realize that God does not show favoritism, but accepts all people who come to Him. Jesus says, He, the Spirit, will glorify me. In the same way that the Son glorifies the Father, the Spirit glorifies the Son. Listen again to John 16, verses 14 and 15. He will glorify me.
because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said, the Spirit will receive from me what he has made known to you. The unbroken continuity of God's eternal truth extends from the Father to the Son, and from the Son to the Spirit, and from the Spirit to all of us. Now much of that truth is written down for us in this book we call the Bible. Sometimes we hear people praying for God's will. I'll tell you what, 90% of God's will is already right here. Right? And anything else that is God's will will never be contrary to what's written here. The Spirit of God will never lead you contrary to the Word of God. So when you sense the Holy Spirit of God working in your life, you can always check that against Scripture. The ability to comprehend and appreciate God's truth is a lifelong process. One that we will never fully achieve in this world. Throughout all of life, the spirit of truth is our faithful guide. And we are called to be faithful followers. I'm not going to name a name so you can relax, but somebody came to me this morning and said, Every time I pray about this, I get the same answer, that I'm supposed to do such and such a thing. And I said, well, if that's what you're sensing, then really there's nothing more to be asked, is there? You just do it. You just obey. Receptivity to the Spirit of God varies widely between persons. In another context, Jesus told a parable about good seed falling on four different kinds of soil. There was the hard packed path where the enemy steals the seed away. There was the shallow earth above a rocky base where the root of the plant failed to develop. There was the thorny earth where worldly concerns choked the word so that it became unfruitful. And then there was the good soil which produced an abundant harvest. Some people shut out the spirit and receive no benefit from his teaching. Some seek his help in times of trouble but pay no attention to his voice at other times. Some hear his voice, but only faintly, because of the commotion of competing voices. And some receive the guidance of the Spirit, producing an abundance of spiritual fruit. And you know what the spiritual fruit is, right? In Galatians chapter 5, and verses 22 and 23, it tells us about the spiritual fruit. It says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's the fruit of the Spirit. That's the fruit that only the Spirit can produce in your life. And it's for all of God's people, not only for the famous saints like Mother Teresa and Billy Graham, but for the kind of people found in many local churches, including ours. People with uncommon spiritual maturity, whose lives exhibit love and quiet confidence. Your life can become good soil. It's important that we do those things that create Good soil from our lives. Things like worshiping together. So I commend you for being here this morning. 
You can also learn and grow in many of the age uh, groupings that we offer here at the church. We have, we have things going on for children and for youth and for women and for men. All of it is, is important. It's important, too, that you read and study your Bible alone and with others. And it's a good thing also that you spend some time associating with Christian friends who will encourage you in your walk. It's important, too, that you spend time with those who aren't believers in Jesus yet and have an influence on them. But be sure that you are influencing them more than they are influencing you. And this is so important. If you want your life to be good soil, you must respond in faithful obedience to the Spirit's prompting. Remember, the leadership of the Spirit in your life will always be in agreement with the Father and the Son. As you faithfully follow the leadership of the Spirit in your life, He will be faithful to lead you in the paths that are right for you. Let's pray. Holy Spirit of truth, thank you that you reveal Jesus to us. Thank you that you apply the work of Jesus. His death on the cross, the shedding of his blood to our individual lives so that we receive the light of the Son. And the light of the Son of God develops in us as we walk in the Spirit. Thank you, Spirit of Truth, that you are faithful to lead us in the paths that are right for us as individuals and families and also as a church family. In Jesus' name. Thank <laughs> you.